today we, I want to talk about reusable design and for that I prepared a couple of examples to explain what is actually reusable design is. Let's start from Lego. It's very common, very known thing. It's a toy. It's a, a block which can be reutilized to build um, different shapes and in this case is a dinosaur. Another example for usable design is a language, right? Where letters can compose words and words can compose sentences and with this tool we can communicate. Similar abstract example would be uh, mathematics. Format is another usable design which can be applied on any type of media. For example, paper or metal. And this is transferable format. There is something common about those three examples. First of all, all of them are ordinary magical. Well known, yet totally invisible. They are widely used, so you're basically not seeing them that much. They are modular. They're using standardized units or dimensions for easy assembly and maintenance. And they're characterized by repetitive um, by repetition, basically, of a single element or sets of elements. And this is one of the things. And you would probably ask, how do you know about it? So reusable design is a form of creation that involves standardized reusable elements, right? And I know it because I'm a standardization designer. Trust me. And you're like, one sec, what is standardization design? Okay, let's try to define it quickly. So, you probably know what is design, because many of you are dealing with it, and it's an act of intentional creation of an object, symbol, or a process. And I can tell that standardization is something more complex, and it follows a number of parameters. And first of them is easily reusable, meaning standardization or standard ready to replicate and reutilize. It's commonly accepted and recognized by a group of people. It is conventional or typical, uh, generally based on believed format. It is comprehensive as it's targeting a couple of use cases. Systematic and consistent and it's done according to a system over a long period of time. It is also fundamentalistic. Based on a template or a pattern, it is timeless, meaning it's standing in test of now and the future time. Usually, standards are future-proof. They're also predictable, easy to forecast or estimate, and lastly, they are measurable. They can be compared or evaluated to its region. Now you would say, well, that sounds a bit boring, restricting, unauthentic, counter-creative, something which is not every designer wants to do. And my question would be then, how to make standardization a thing, right? So it's interesting and fun. And I came with this one plus four in power of infinite plus one step solution. It's a cycle, basically. I'm starting from researching and finding trends and innovation. Then those trends and innovation I disassemble, analyze and try to find some instances inside. Later on, I categorize them uh, and ordering by results of common attributes and taking them to, to, um, to a building stage where I build a testable subject. This testable subject goes to the testing in natural environment where I can observe the changes. Cycling several times through the cycle, at the point of categorization, we can deliver the final standard. So basically, Standardization designer is responsible for researching, 
constantly popping up trends, best practices and innovative solutions, disassembling patterns and behaviors, analyzing in context of internal and external consistencies, categorizing attributes, comparing parameters, establishing the common ground for standardization. I also do composing the testable subjects to test assumptions. I'm testing the composed scene for flaws, inconsistencies and other fuck-ups. I'm delivering the pure convincing flawless rules, examples and guides of standards. I also try to keep it creative. And the last thing is I'm constantly being frequently misnamed. Let's focus for a second on the last point. I find myself called Difrini, Ivegan, Jugini, Afghani. Once I've been called Ah. Really? Ah? It is even not in my name. It's E V G E N A. From now on, I would say, let's just call me E, right? As we commonly agree on that, it's a new standard. It is easy, E. In this presentation, I want to cover all of those points and I brought one project um, to show how the process works. It's named E-Waste Revolution and we're starting from basically a research where I collect PCB boards and I observe them, they have multiple elements, very interesting connectors, transistors and many different things which at this point they are not many things to do with but only going and disassembling them. And I came to one question, how do I disassemble a PCB board? I found out that actually boiling them or cooking them for 10 minutes makes a difference. They start to disassemble by themselves. They tear apart and I take the small parts and collect them for the next phase, which is categorization. I order them by attributes and common appearances and those ones reminding me of sperm with two legs, which is striving to create a new life, probably some electronic life. I also find small characters on the board, like those transistors. The next phase would be to compose something out of those objects. And to say true, I observe several paradigms on how to create a new thing. So one of them would be is to take an object, remove a parameter or attribute, and you're getting a new item or adding some detail and you're getting another new item. Replacing an attribute also works in this case. There's another way of creating via merge. Whenever you take two objects, you take their parameters and you merge them into one consistent thing. The more complicated one is via denial, is when you take two of the objects and you say, I preserve the parameters, but whenever I get too close in appearance to one of those, I'm striving away. This is the most innovative way. And there's another one, right? Which is super secret technique, copy paste. And in this project, that's exactly what I've done. I just took the welded elements from the weldering and I collected them and placed on a sheet and filled in with the, um, the component um, material. After that, I took them for testing. And in testing phase, I'm just testing something. I don't know what is it exactly, but it's probably standing the test. Those things are upside down and they're not flat. Delivering. This is the most important part and it's all about the appearance and the presentation. In this case, I've produced medications that are for your use at your own risk and 
That's it. Now about keeping it creative. I think it's the most complicated topic, but I brought a couple more projects to show. And this is copyrighted to me, E. Square vials is a set of objects that are evolved from a question. What happens if I take a toy and a car and combine those? The obvious answer would be a toy car, right? But if we go with the denial approach, what if it's not a toy car? What is it then? Well, it's a wooden block. I just collected parameters of each of those um, things, toy and car. I categorized them and started to create objects. Each of those objects testing some parameter, for example, proportion, material, which became a frictionless. I added motors, I tried to steer the wooden block, I added solar panels and different electronics to, to see how they behave. This is one of them is tested in the environment. So this object rides around some plastic box. The next step I did reiteration and took the created objects and reverse engineered them. And while the process I found out that the batteries are 78 degrees from the body and many of those because it was a problem with a drill. I found out it's a nice birthmark, I should preserve it. Then I categorized all of the appearance I've created, trying to evaluate variations of how things can work. Right? I made experiments, visual and technical, how parts are working together. And through this process, there was created a new object, which is a merge of N11 and 14, and it's named Gr. This specific one had a character. Whenever you pick it up, it starts to grow. Very interesting behavior, very similar to an angry animal, like a cat, for example. I found out that it's an interesting thing that the box can have a character. So I started to develop more and test things. For example, this one, which you probably cannot see because of the sun. This one doesn't like attention, a spotlight. This one rides away in a dark corner because it, um, whenever you put a sunlight on it. Another object which is um, um, a wind allergic, I would say. As it gets into the wind area, this wing um, locks the um, electronics signal and it rides away from the wind into some silent area. Another object is reacting to sound and as louder the sound is, farther and faster it rides away. It doesn't like when you scream on it. Those objects or cuboids or squabbiles are made according to the standardization design and one of the parameters of them is systematic, right? I made this project over one year of time according to some system and it is fundamental, uh, fundamentalistic. It is involving a core base or template which I basically invented. Those are wooden boxes with some engine, electronics and character. And those are conventional. They based on Believe It format, which I invented for myself during the process. Another project would be something more realistic, which is a football ball for MITRE. It was done also a number of years ago. This project I started from collecting and researching the history of the brand. The next step would be to revise engineer balls. And I should tell you guys, if you haven't tried to build a ball in 3D, you should try it out, especially this one, 32 panels. This is a challenging thing. As a collecting process, 
I screened images on balls and made photos of those to create a large collection of variations that later on I investigated in sketches, comparing variations and trying to understand which one of them is most desirable. And later on, one of the definitions was to create a ball which can fit the style of the football team. So the ball should use the color scheme of the football team and those are UK football teams. We built one 3D model to test the ball. Ever be the same again. You basically cannot see it, it doesn't matter. Um, this design follows the same standardization principles. It is measurable, basically, basically can be evaluated in comparison to its origin. So it's a standard ball, but with different shape and different patching design. And it is commonly accepted. It's recognized by FIFA and used by football teams. And I don't know, but do you see here underwear? Yeah, kicking the butt of the ball. Walhau is another project, and this is the last one for today. This project started from collecting and systemizing elements and creating design system. I analyzed behavior, variety, and options available on the market and in the internet, basically. Later on, we've created a comprehensive um, system, which is targeting a wide range of cases. And this is another parameter of the standardization. Then we've created an easily reusable, ready to replace and reutilize elements. Same following the standardization principle. Video. Yeah. And this one of the examples of testing of the system. Basically, this is a built prototype that uses those elements. And in this case, we're creating an application. Those all of the elements are one by one reutilized from the common system named Freya. And as a result of this cycle is time-proof standing in test of now and future design and the approach here we're taking is trendless future-proof approach where we just use minimalistic design and try to not ride any of the trends the end result of it is predictable easy to forecast or estimate interface that's it Thank you.